72 years after Japan surrendered in Second World War, Japan's mainstream TV aired a highly controversial documentary about atrocities committed by a Japanese germ unit in China. How is Shinzo Abe's government reacting to an episode in Japan's history that they had claimed never happened? And seven decades since the partition of India and Pakistan, the disputes between the two seem nowhere near being resolved. Why is it taking so long? Welcome to The Point, live from Beijing, I'm Li Xin. Tuesday marks the 72nd anniversary of Japan's surrender in World War II. The Japanese government, however, marked the day as usual with a ceremony to honor the war dead and to pray for peace. Of course, these were uh, in quotation marks. For the fifth consecutive year, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe failed to mention reflection in his speech. Early in the day, he sent a monetary offering to the Yatsushikuni Shrine, which honors the war dead, including Class A war criminals. There seems, however, to be a silver lining. Just two days before the ceremony, the Japanese public TV network NHK released a documentary about the atrocities committed by the Japanese Army Unit 731, a notorious germ warfare unit once stationed in China. The unit is charged to have conducted experiments on live people during war, an accusation the Japanese government has been denying. So has there been any change in the Abe government's attitude about Japan's war past and with these historical materials being shown to the public how could the government continue to live in denial joining me in the discussion today from Tokyo is Michael Jujek an adjunct professor of political science at Temple University Japan campus and here in Beijing by uh, Cheng Xiaohe an associate professor from the School of International Studies at Renmin University welcome to the show gentlemen now professor Jujek in the this year's annual ceremony to honor the so-called war dead from World War II, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe once again did not mention Japan's wartime atrocities or the suffering that Japan had inflicted upon some nations including China and Korea. Neither did he mention the pledge not to engage in war again. Why is Abe so entrenched in his position? Well, it depends on what you think his positions are. Uh, his position is that Japan has no need to be apologetic about its past. It, however, he is not denying that the past happened. Uh, he just simply has a very different view about to whom Japan owes an explanation. Mostly in his view, th the government of Japan owes the Japanese people an explanation of what happened. Uh, he does not feel, however, and has resisted consistently through his life, uh, a sense that the people of South Korea and the people of China have a special need and a special uh, requirement that they should receive special treatment by him as regards World War II. That is outrageous. I mean, I simply cannot understand why he would think that the Chinese people who suffered so much, who died, so, so many Chinese people died under Japanese invasion during Second World War. Why would President Abe think that he, you know, there is no need to apologize uh, for the, to the J Chinese people for that? Uh, Professor Cheng, uh, can the Chinese really take this kind of position? I don't think so. so you see, so what Abe Sang did demonstrate his consistencies in his attitude towards Second World War. You see, in the past years, Abe Sang's uh, repeatedly denies uh, the war crimes committed by Japan during the Second World Wars, and I think it's, uh, he did similar things, try to. Uh, 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 whitewash uh, what Japanese military forces did during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Jujik, let's take a look at his um, practice, his um, way to handle the Yatsukuni, Yatsukuni, crime, uh, Yatsukuni Shrine this time. Uh, although he didn't go, uh, although Abe didn't go in person, it is the fifth consecutive year that he has made a ritual offering to the shrine and uh, since he retook office as Prime Minister in 2012, the donation was made in his capacity as the leader of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. What's the consideration? Has he changed his attitude about visiting the shrine or was it just a compromise? Well, he hasn't visited the shrine in person since December of 2013.
And prior to his return to power, he had essentially promised his followers that he would go every year. He has not followed through on that promise, uh, which uh, his followers must find uh, very disturbing. He does make the ritual offerings at the summer uh, 5th, August 15th commemoration. He also has traditionally made them at the Spring Festival and the Autumn Festival of Yasukuni Shrine. He still has to make gestures in the direction of the right wing, which uh, basically returned him to power in 2012. However, he has not been their champion in terms of Yasukuni Shrine. And indeed, today was extraordinary in that for the first time that he, since he's ever been prime minister, not a single member of the Japanese cabinet went to Yasukuni. Mm -hmm. That what, is unprecedented yeah, and it indicates that, that yes. we've gone beyond. Yeah. What are the possible reasons well, behind basically, that decision? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there, are, there are several uh, for this possible change. Uh, first of which is that the, the, Japan is moving beyond this uh, obsession with the idea of avoiding responsibility for the war. That's a distinct possibility that even Mr. Abe himself is seeing. You know, we, we, we have uh, had great difficulty have it, to have good relations with China, good relations with South Korea. Uh, perhaps this obsession we have of, of not talking about the war uh, has been to our detriment. Yeah, that Professor could be one reason. Mm -hmm. Another reason could be that no, one is, that no one is actually afraid of Mr. Abe being in power for as long as, uh, the, for as nine years, which is what we were talking about in the spring. Now it looks like he might just have one more year and this is just a uh, one last year of glory and then he'll be gone. Mm -hmm. Professor Chung, what do you think are the reasons uh, behind uh, the fact that uh, none of the cabinet members of Shinzo Abe visited the shrine this year? Uh, would you believe in the first reason that Professor Jejuk mentioned that he, you know, actually really changed his mind? Uh, you see, uh, uh, I witnessed uh, such a kind of uh, uh, unfolding dramas uh, made by Japanese politicians. On the one hand, I noticed some ch slight changes on the part of the uh, Japanese politicians. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I cannot discern any significant, significant changes in uh, Abe's and others' uh, Japanese politicians' action of war. And there's a number of reasons. You see, it's, uh, it has something to do with Abe's personal ambitions. And uh, Abe's want to make uh, Japan's uh, great again, so particularly to make Japan as a, a major political power. And so they, he, he need to uh, finish the process of so-called normalization, statehood normalization. And that's the one reason. Second, you see, it has something to do with uh, North Korea's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Japanese LDPs. And these parties uh, traditionally have very strong lines on the attitude toward uh, Second World War. And also it has some, something to do with the geopolitical atmosphere in Northeast Asians as uh, so strategic rivalries between China and the Japan seemingly loom large and ja Japan's, uh, particularly Japan's politicians need to stir up the nationalist sentiment. Yeah. Let's take a look at this documentary which has caught the attention of many uh, people here in China. As I mentioned, NHK released a documentary about uh, the Japanese Army Unit 731, a germ warfare unit, uh, um, which contained some new evidence acquired from Russia. Many people in China praised the showing, although right-wing netizens of Japan still claim that these evidence were faked. Um, Professor Jujik, how do you look at the showing of this documentary? I mean, although it's commendable that they have the courage and good conscience to show it, isn't this something the Japanese side should have done a long time ago anyway. Well, of course, it's something that the Japanese uh, government should have uh, supported a long time ago. But history is what it is. You, we, we would love to change it and make it the way we wanted it to be. However, the, in this case, NHK, which is the government broadcaster, uh, most likely felt a little bit uh, more free than it has been over the last few, the f last few years, at least the first years of the Abe administration. They were quite concerned about, uh, you know, what are the boundaries of, our, of what we can talk about the war? What has, have, has there been a shift toward the right? Uh, but this broadcast clearly shows that they think that a, a 
a balanced and open uh, presentation about what did happen in northern China under uh, Japanese occupation there is that this is entirely acceptable and, and something that they will have suffer no repercussions for at all and instead will get complimented for. Well, this unit is charged of uh, having conducted experiments on live people causing about 3,000 deaths, among them civilians, including women and children. The Japanese government never uh, acknowledged or has been denying the crime, and no one involved in the unit has ever been tried for war crimes. Now that this documentary has been shown, Professor Cheng, do you think it's going to make, give any pressure on the Japanese government to continue or to stop its behavior of denial of the past? Uh, but in the first of all, so I like to appreciate NHK's move to broadcast such a kind of shows. You see, so as well known so TV's uh, uh, NHK's demonstrate its professionalism so to find the fact and show the fact to the world. To, 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 to the world. And secondly, I so also so appreciate NHK's courage to uh, make such shows available publicly. So you, uh, particularly, so you see, against the background that Japan's uh, nationalist and uh, conservatives and uh, work hard try to whitewash the war uh, crimes committed by Japanese military forces and also so, uh, encourage Japanese government to adopt more measures to make J Japan's a uh, normal state. And uh, they did uh, great things. I think I uh, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we've seen some nationalist response in Japanese social media where netizens still are saying that uh, you know these evidences have been faked by the Russian side and they are the result of torture in during the interrogation professor Jeju go how do you look at the credibility of these evidences uh, is this the question to me yes briefly please one, no, within one the, minute. The, yeah. the, the right wing the, the right wing here uh, finds problems with everything uh, they are a fringe movement. Uh, they felt empowered when Mr. Abe came back to power, but he has left them behind. Uh, he does not uh, take power from them, and indeed, the most right-wing members of his administration have been his greatest disappointments. Like, for example, uh, Tomomi Inada, the former uh, Minister of Defense. Mm -hmm. uh, she was given major responsibilities. She's a ver quite very much the right-wing icon, uh, very much a favorite of the netizens, and uh, she was a complete disaster in her position. He doesn't really want to necessarily associate with them directly if he wants to stay in power uh, f for a very long time. Yeah, but maybe that does not mean that he wants to change his mind, but more to, uh, for the sake of staying in power, but we have to go there. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Professor Michael Jujek, uh, an adjunct professor of political science at Temple University Japan campus and in Beijing, Cheng Xiaohe, an associate professor from the School of International Studies at Reming University. Well, my take is this, and here is my point. It's really a strange thing that when somebody treats you really badly all the time, you would actually feel good when this person suddenly appears to be treating you slightly better. That's the strange reality we're in at the moment. Right-wing Japanese politicians have been denying Japan's war atrocities and visiting the shrine against uh, repeated protests from its neighboring countries. When NHK showed this documentary about the 731 unit, it's strangely worth celebrating. I was told that actually it's a tradition that every year during this time, there would be several such documentaries shown on mainstream media about what the Japanese war pa about the Japanese war past. So on the one hand, we welcome such showings. On the other hand, let us not be carried away from the big picture. So long as the Japanese right-wing politicians are in power, they're likely to continue denying what happened. And you're watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll take a short break and we'll be back right after this.
70 years ago, the last Viceroy of India, Louis Mountbatten, Muhammad Ali Jinnah and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru agreed to establish Hindu-dominated India and Muslim-dominated Pakistan. They hoped it might bring an end to ethnic violence and herald a new beginning for the region. However, what happened in reality has been continuous conflict even till today, especially in Kashmir. How come the two sides have yet to resolve their differences in seven decades? Will they need another 70 years to do so? Joining me in the discussion today is Atul Aneja, China correspondent of The Hindu. And from Islamabad, we have Sultan Hali, a writer and security analyst. But first, First, let's take a quick look at this history of the partition. At the stroke of midnight on August 14, 1947, the British broke the British Indian Empire into two sovereign states, India and Pakistan. Pakistan marks its independence on August 14, and India's celebrations come a day later. The creation of the two countries disrupted millions of lives. Pakistan was mostly Muslim, while India was majority Hindu. A mass migration followed. Violence and bloodshed persisted as about 15 million Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs, fearing discrimination, swapped countries. The upheaval left at least one million dead. Pakistan and India have fought three wars since 1947, and their relations remain tense, particularly over the disputed Himalayan region of Kashmir, which both countries claim in full. And let's begin our discussions. And um, many thanks for the two gentlemen for joining us. Mr. Anaja, let me come to you first. Why are the two sides still uh, not having peace with each other 70 years after their partition? Well, there are several factors why we have not achieved peace. Uh, and, part, and it begins with history, really, the historical factors, which uh, the, the very fact of the partition which you mentioned and the, and the uh, bitterness that it caused at a people-to-people -people level. Uh, so that has been an enduring memory. But uh, having said that, uh, I think there's a parallel process as well starting uh, with the new generation coming in both countries, uh, uh, which does not have those bitter memories uh, of, of what their forefathers, what, or at least what their fathers had experienced. So there are, th th it's not a single narrative which is going on between India and Pakistan, though dominantly still we have yet to uh, erase uh, the conflictual element within our relationship, which yeah. is still 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 dominant. So but there are there are hopeful signs as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hali, what is the Pakistani take on this issue? Well, uh, you, you see, there were certain scars that were left behind. In fact, what happened was that the British, perhaps uh, uh, by uh, intent, they left a certain unfinished agenda, like Kashmir you mentioned in the opening of the program, uh, is an unfinished agenda. Because uh, what happened was that uh, uh, now we, uh, what we thought earlier as uh, something of uh, a myth has been proved that the, uh, the line of partition was uh, distorted at the behest of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru by uh, Lord Mountbatten, who leaned hard on Sir Cyril Radcliffe, who was in charge of the Boundary Commission. His secretary, uh, uh, Lord B Beaumont, he died about six years back, and his grandnephew has published his diaries, which uh, prove that uh, Lord Mountbatten had actually forced Sir Cyril Radcliffe to uh, distort the boundaries. And because of the distortion in the boundaries, India got access, uh, ground access to Kashmir, which uh, left uh, the Kashmir, uh, the Himalayan province, which was supposed to be, uh, you know, governed by a Hindu Maharaja, and the people were supposed to decide their own fate. Uh, so uh, he he was coerced to sign a letter of accession to the Indians, so, and that is yeah. the reason why we had the first war in 1947. So, Mr. Hali, you're and talking about that, the historical Pakistan reason about war. yes, yes. Let me let me give a little bit of time for the Indian guests to respond to what you're just saying. Uh, what is the British responsibility in the process, Mr. Aneja, and uh, could it have been done differently? I think so. Uh, I think uh, uh, Radcliffe, uh, Cyril Radcliffe, who was in charge of the Boundary Commission, I think there were very arbitrary ways in which the boundary was uh, uh, delimited. Uh, and as a result of it, there were huge migrations of populations which were on the other side of this boundary. 
Uh, and because of the fact that communal rioting had started actually in 1946 in Calcutta, mm -hmm. uh, that 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 set a spiral of communal violence on both sides. So I, I, I give a lot of responsibility to to the way it was done. The the partition lines were drawn both on the east and the mm -hmm. west side. Mm -hmm. uh, so 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 that that's 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 a primary factor. I'm not sure historically at what uh, uh, my colleague from. The on the Pakistani side said that it was particularly by individuals like Nehru or Mountbatten. I think there was a general pressure after the Second World War for the British that this was becoming too much of a burden to hold on to its colonies. And that is probably objective uh, and even a geopolitical factor uh, which led to this haste in drawing the boundaries. Yeah. Perhaps we have to factor that in as well. Well, anyway, that, that was 70 years ago. And during the 70 years time, there have been numerous efforts. For instance, in January 1948, the UN Security Council adopted the resolution establishing a uh, commission, a UN commission for India and Pakistan to mediate the dispute. There was a genuine effort by the UN and the international community set to settle the issue, but the plan failed to be uh, implemented. Mr. Hali, uh, what do you think was the window opportunity that was missed during that uh, uh, effort of uh, mediation? Well, uh, despite the fact that we have had uh, three wars and we, ha we have been on the brink of war a number of times, uh, uh, when uh, General Parvez Musharraf was the president of Pakistan, he visited India, and, uh, he had a summit at Agra, and it was assumed that he had an out-of-the-box solution and probably will be able to resolve Kashmir. But unfortunately, uh, hardliners prevailed, uh, and uh, these, uh, that was the chance which was missed. After that, in 2003, we managed to have a ceasefire on the line of control, which held pretty well till 2014. That was when Narendra Modi, the current Prime Minister, took over. And I do not know what is his agenda, but since then there has been ceasefire violation. It is going on tit for tat because once India violates, Pakistan retaliates. We, uh, it is difficult to uh, you know, uh, keep quiet about it. And that is the reason why the tension has prevailed. Well, I wanted to come to this later, but since uh, Mr. Hali has already mentioned it, so Mr. Aneja, what, is, uh, what has been the reason behind the failure uh, round after round between India and Pakistan to resolve this issue bilaterally. I mean, this uh, cease, ceasefire we heard talking about uh, in 2013, how come it didn't hold? Was there a lack of political will on both sides? No, it, it's, it's very interesting. I think we got to, I would just pick on uh, uh, Mr. Hali's other point. Uh, which is about the Agra summit and what followed, which was basically in 2005, to, uh, ag this is post-Agra summit, when uh, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and Pakistan's uh, President Pervez Musharraf, they had come to a formulation, and it was uh, in the public domain, that we would resolve the Kashmir issue uh, by an uh, innovative way, which was to have soft borders. That is, you do not firmly define the boundary. The existing line of control becomes uh, the de facto boundary, and there is people to people exchanges, trade, etc., uh, families re reuniting, and that would be how a uh, pragmatic solution to, be uh, to this crisis can be found. I think that's still a great idea. That's an idea which needs to be revisited, and uh, the time has come that, that, that we do do. Mm -hmm. We do that. Mr. Hali, uh, how do you, what is the Pakistani position towards this idea? And uh, if it has not been accepted, what are the reasons behind it? And if it has been otherwise, uh, what are the reasons? also well basically you see uh we are living now in an age where concentration is uh, no longer the order of the day. And we have to take a leaf uh, from China, which has uh, set the record for uh, trying to uh, improve its relations with its neighbors because we cannot rise to our true potential unless uh, we sink our differences, however deep they may be, and unless we talk to each other. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, we have a very hard line uh, r rulers, the Bharatiya Janta Party in India, which uh, has uh, which does not give any quarter I, uh, uh, when I say that I do not give the full blame to the Indians there are some people non-state actors on the Pakistani side who have also been uh, provoking India by some uh, unprecedented attacks which have uh, set the you know tone uh, from uh, talking to each other to uh, actually a, ho a hostile attitude so uh, what can be done now is that if both sides they sit down and they talk to each other and they are convinced that 
dropping concentration and instead uh, we de rely on cooperation that is the only way we can move forward and that is the only way which is the future for the people of not only India and Pakistan but the entire region yeah yeah well indeed the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, said in his Independence Day speech that bullets or abuse won't solve the Kashmir issue love will uh, but Mr. Aneja, what do you think is his real message? Because we have seen some conflicting signals somehow uh, coming from Mr. Modi towards the Pakistani counterpart. He invited Nawaz Sharif to attend his inauguration, but he also refused last year to attend a summit of the SARC, which is a South Asian country's platform in Islamabad. So what exactly is Modi's contribution to the issue here? Well, there's a certain context in which Modi operates. Is, is now taking his positions on this issue. Now, uh, we were just talking about the 2005 and you asked me why did it did not hold. There was one very important incident which happened which sort of derailed this process and that was the Mumbai attacks which a Pakistani colleague has also mentioned about non-state actors, etc. Now, that uh, we have still not got a closure to that. That was a straightforward case of terrorism where innocent people have been killed uh, in, in, in hundreds and uh, in a very horrific way. Uh, the Pakistani investigators have done a commendable job so far to, 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 to nail down and, and to bring the perpetrators to justice. But we are still not, the closure has not come. These people are still going around, they are still at large. So I think if Pakistani side moves on the Mumbai side, I'm not talking of terrorism in general, which is important, but it, I'm talking to something very specific. Yeah. Then that will give a lot of opportunities for people who want to normalize the relations. I coming, see. Coming to Narendra I see. Modi. I have, I have really 20 seconds to, give, to let Mr. Hali respond to uh, this question you just mentioned. Mr. Hali, what is the Pakistani position on this? 20 seconds, please, really. You see, terrorism is something which plagues both India and Pakistan. And the only solution for moving forward is that if we join our forces to fight terrorism per se and instead of blaming each other. Okay, we have to leave it there. It's a very important but very long discussion. We'll come back to that in the future. Many thanks, gentlemen. Atul Aneja, China correspondent of the Hindu and from Islamabad, Sultan Hali, a writer and security analyst. And here is my last point. Although the disputes continue between India and Pakistan 70 years after partition, the fact remains that there are more ties between the two peoples than you might at first believe by reading some of the Bellicosa media reports. Many people have friends across the border and there are cross-border marriages that regularly take place. We understand that one of Pakistan's biggest worries over Kashmir is the fear that India could control their major water supplies. It is also not difficult to see why there are still so many tensions, but observers believe it is unlikely that that there will be a major war as a result of the continuing border dispute. This is something that even the leaders of the two countries fully comprehend. When there is political will on both sides to come to a settlement, anything is possible. Let's hope that time, that time is not far away from now. And that's it for this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. Thank you very much for joining us. And you've got the point.